About what percentage of hazardous waste is in the nation is produced in Texas? Do you have any idea? I couldn't tell. It's about 25%. 25%? 25% of all toxic waste produced in the United States is generated in Texas. We thought this one staggering fact was sufficient justification for us to title this Earthline show, Toxic Texas. Hello and welcome to Earthline. In this program, we'll take a look at toxic pollution problems in Texas. We'll learn about the right to know law known as Sarah Title III and take a peek at promising technology for reducing pollution. The host for this program is Robert Bryce. Robert? Hi. Did you know that Texas leads the nation in a number of areas regarding the release and production of toxic waste? We'll be back in a few minutes to discuss toxic waste in Texas with Neil Carmen and John Fisher. But first, we have conservation news and comment. Bridget, how are state lawmakers performing this session? Well, George, let's say we're cautiously optimistic. But environmentalists have actually scored some victories on the bill to reauthorize the Highway Commission. Despite opposition from the Commission, the House and Senate adopted several environmental amendments, including one to require a full federal-style environmental impact statement when a highway crosses sensitive land or habitat. This could have an impact on the outer loop and projects like it. Another amendment establishes a permanent six-member environmental advisory committee appointed by the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the speaker. Also added was tougher restrictions on the highway commissioners having conflicts of interest and a requirement that the commission explain just how it determines the priority of highway construction projects. A conference committee will have to reconcile differences in the House and Senate versions, hopefully strengthening the bill, but it could very well be weakened in the same process. Meanwhile, the governor's bill placing a moratorium on all new commercial hazardous waste facilities cleared the Senate with only a few scratches. A killer amendment attached by Senator Ken Armbrister was easily removed after environmentalists marshaled a deluge of protest calls to his office. But the bill was watered down some in response to heavy industry lobbying. Environmental groups will be watching and working hard to keep the bill on track in the House where the chemical lobby has much greater influence. Another major bill that is expected to encounter heavy opposition in the House is Lieutenant Governor Bob Bullock's bill to create a Texas Department of Natural Resources. It would replace several agencies and have a clear mandate to protect the environment. The Texas Chemical Council has come out strongly against it, but Bullock has convinced some heads of targeted agencies to support it. Notably, Commissioner Robert Bernstein, the head of the Department of Health. Also a tepid supporter is the chair of the Water Commission, Buck Wynn. However, in exchange for Bernstein's support, only the Solid Waste Division would be removed from the Department of Health. This is disappointing, but it is still a major victory that the Texas Air Control Board, Water Commission, and parts of the Railroad Commission would be merged into a new agency. Back in Austin, the city's Solid Waste Recycling Program is stepping into high gear. Colored plastic buckets can be seen in front of homes everywhere as the city distributes the new containers for recyclable waste pickup. On a related matter, the safe disposal of household chemicals is a constant problem. In the past, the city has sponsored a single home chemical collection day each year. Now a year-round drop site will be operated. It is planned for an opening in September in South Austin. Until then, keep hazardous chemicals in a safe location. In other state legislative action, Attorney General Dan Morales is pushing a bill to get tough on polluters. Currently, Texas has weak environmental laws and even weaker enforcement. As a result, the laws don't deter polluters, according to the House sponsor of the bill, Representative Steve Wolins. The average administrative penalty for hazardous and solid waste division of the Water Commission is seven to $8,000. The average judicial penalty is one to three million dollars. And we have got to make a decision as a matter of public policy, what's the purpose of a penalty? Is the purpose of a penalty to spank someone, to spank them on the wrist and let them incur that cost as a cost of doing business? Or are we going to hit them over the head with a two by four and make them sorry for what they did and make sure that they're not going to be able to afford to want to do it again? 
Under the bill, polluters would be charged higher fines and stiffer jail sentences. Also, a governor's task force would be able to step in if an agency fails to take action. Another provision would require the heads of polluting companies to be in the courtroom for the entire trial and sentencing. The chemical lobby is opposing this bill. Cleaning up Town Lake and the Colorado River is the idea behind the proposed urban watershed ordinance. The ordinance requires new urban construction to include filtering of runoff pollution in the plans. As an option, money may be contributed for the construction of a regional filtration system. The law only begins to address the problem of urban runoff, but is being opposed by the Chamber of Commerce and the Capital Area Builders Association because it may discourage urban development. Supporters of the law are encouraged to contact council members to indicate their sentiments. Wildlife sanctuaries, water quality protection, and recreational open space. These are the benefits being proposed by the Balcones Canyonlands Conservation Plan, a plan designed to permanently preserve 60,000 acres of the Travis County Hill Country. The price tag for all this could exceed $100 million to be paid from federal, state, and local sources. Currently, a bill that would create an authority to administer the plan is being considered by the Texas legislature. If it passes, expect the plan to be as hot as Austin weather this summer as the campaign to get the voter approval of the bonds to help pay for the plan gets underway. For A Better World, I'm George Avery. And I'm Bridget Shea. And now for our feature. Except for the leak of deadly hydrofluoric acid that was escaping from the Marathon refinery, it was a normal October evening in Texas City. We had another chemical accident known as the Marathon Hydrofluoric Acid Spill. Uh, this happened on homecoming night. The football game had not yet started. And the $100,000 siren system that Texas City has to warn us when we have a, a chemical explosion or a chemical release, uh, I failed to work properly. As the kids got to the stadium, they found out that the game had been called off because of the chemical release. Well, they walked home in the stuff. Well, we didn't know if it meant us because our siren wasn't on, or if it was just the people over there. It was very confusing how it was happening. I could smell the chemical in the air, and I knew I was smelling something bad because it burned. It, the minute it hit your nose, it burned. It burned your throat. You could feel it burning your chest. It hurt to be out in the air. Well, nothing was coming over the radio and nothing was coming over the TV. So we didn't know what to do. Come to find out that the Nestler Center was directly in the plume of the chemical. And the people that had been evacuated to the Nestler Center had to be moved again. It just shows how Texas City hasn't learned a thing since the 47 explosion. They're still just as unprepared as they were. 3,000 residents were evacuated, and about 1,000 were hospitalized. The problems in Texas City are just a single chapter of the story of Texas, the toxic state. There are currently 28 federal Superfund sites in Texas. The Environmental Protection Agency estimates the average cost to clean up a Superfund site at $40 million. These sites are contaminated with a smorgasbord of dangerous chemicals and heavy metals, and they continue to contaminate our groundwater, our soil, and the surface water of surrounding neighborhoods. These are cleanup activities from 1988 at the Geneva Industries site on the western edge of Houston. Like most Superfund sites, the owners of Geneva were unable or unavailable to pay for the cleanup. As of 1988, when activity was delayed, Taxpayers had invested over $22 million to investigate and begin this one site. Some of the chemicals that have been found at Geneva are PCBs, xylene, exposure to which is known to damage unborn fetuses, and toluene, which is responsible for lung, kidney, and brain damage in extended doses. Work at Geneva halted in 1988 when the state of Alabama decided they didn't want the waste from Geneva. Since then, the situation has been in limbo. But who can blame Alabama? An additional 29 Texas sites have been designated as state Superfund sites. These sites are administered by the Texas Water Commission. Here are some numbers to give us a better idea why we call Texas the toxic state. 
According to the Community Right to Know reports from 1988, compiled by the Citizens Fund in Washington, D.C., Texas is the second highest state in the United States for toxic releases with 724 million pounds. Texas is number one in the country in the amount of toxic chemicals released into the air, 169 million pounds. So which industries produce this tremendous amount of pollution? The chemical industry leads the pack at 570 million pounds. The primary metals, petroleum, fabricated metals, and paper industries round out the top five. What do these numbers really mean? The only way to qualify the cost of our pollution problem is in personal terms. Consider this. Texas companies in 1988 released 51 million pounds of chemicals that are known or suspected carcinogens. Manufacturers in our state also released 95 million pounds of chemicals known or suspected to cause birth defects. These toxic chemicals have invaded numerous groundwater supplies, the air we breathe, our soil, and our bodies. Why do our state health officials continue to allow these releases into our environment? In Jonesville, near Odessa, a neighborhood of 19 houses has reported 18 cases of cancer. Jonesville is just a few miles south of the huge Odessa petrochemical complex. Officials at the Texas State Health Department warn us that it is difficult to determine the reason for abnormally high disease rates. Meanwhile, residents of Jonesville, Beaumont, Texas City, and other disease-ridden communities are left to fend for themselves. Despite these health problems, Texas continues to invite toxic industries into our state. Consider Formosa Plastics. They received $225 million in tax abatements and infrastructure improvements to expand their nine-year-old facility in Point Comfort in Calhoun County. Formosa has a very long pollution history. They were sued in Delaware and Louisiana for hazardous waste violations. And this February, they were fined a record $3.3 million by the EPA for violations of hazardous waste laws at the Point Comfort facility. Why do our state officials continue to court this type of toxic business? Our politicians say we need the jobs and the money these companies bring. And although we have gained tax revenue and economic development from these industries, we've also gained a legacy of environmental contamination that will last long after these companies are gone. Industrial development in Texas has been occurring at a breakneck speed since oil was discovered here about 90 years ago. And the petrochemical industry has played a big part in it. It's created economic development, jobs, and much needed products. But another side effect of the industry has been the creation of toxic waste. Tonight, to discuss these issues, we have John Fisher from the Texas Chemical Council. John has been with the Chemical Council for 11 years. He has 20 years of experience in legislature and legislative issues. Um, and uh, we're glad to have him here. For, we also have Neil Carmen. Neil has been with the Texas Air Control Board for ten and a half years. Um, he's appearing tonight as a, as a private citizen, but he also brings a wealth of experience uh, investigating the industry and industry problems. Thanks for being here. Um, Mr. Fisher, uh, according to 1988 data, Texas leads the nation in a number of areas regarding toxic waste production, uh, release, etc. Um, why is that? Well, I think uh, one of the major reasons is because we lead the nation in the types of facilities that are being required to report mm -hmm. under that law. The most important thing, though, about those figures is that those are just uh, cumulative figures based on emissions into the ambient air. Mm -hmm. They do not reflect the concentration of those materials in the ambient air, nor do they reflect exposure of people or the environment to those materials. In fact, if you were going to look at the sources of toxic materials in Texas, even in a heavily industrial area, you'd find that less than 20% of the air toxics come from industry. Approximately one quarter would come from automobiles, and over half of them would come from retail businesses and homes. Mm -hmm. um, Neil, you spent a lot of time investigating industry and, and uh, air pollution, uh, which Mr. Fisher just mentioned. Um, why do you think there, is there a problem with, with toxic air emissions in the state? Well, we've had uh, a lot of citizen complaints, uh, which I think have been traced systematically back to uh, large chemical plants versus uh, small, uh, you know, businesses uh, or automobiles. Much more, uh, in terms of the uh, time that I've been with the uh, Air Control Board since 1980, 
So, you know, I see the problems being much more associated in terms of toxic uh, air and water pollution from uh, these large uh, chemical manufacturing facilities in Texas. Uh -huh. You also mentioned earlier that uh, the, uh, you felt that some of the Sarah Title III information, the figures were actually low, uh, that uh, perhaps the reporting wasn't uh, completely accurate. Uh, why do you think that? Well, I think, uh, you know, speaking from my own point of view, that uh, I'm not sure it's an industry's, uh, you know, best interest to, you know, report everything uh, completely 100% accurately. It, it would be, you know, I think, uh, behoove them to probably try to report things, uh, you know, at a lower level to, uh, to reflect that maybe the pollution isn't nearly as bad as it's been. Uh -huh. well, Robert, I'd, I'd like to respond to that. Sure. I, don't, I think there's significant incentives in the law for people to accurately report their emissions. I, I don't see any basis for that charge, Neil, and I'd certainly welcome you to bring forth some evidence supporting that claim. Well, see, I think one of the facts is that a lot of these plants don't have uh, sufficient uh, monitoring devices to actually prove uh, factually that uh, these data are absolutely correct. Uh, so your, your statements reflect a lack of understanding in the method of reporting Sarah Title III emissions. You see, Neil, the emissions initially were calculated based on worst case assumptions, worst case formulas. Once you begin monitoring those fugitive emissions, which account for a good deal of them because you've got theoretical emissions from every valve, every joint. Once you begin monitoring those, the emissions reported actually get lower because the theoretical reports are much higher than the actual reports. Mm -hmm. That reflects the fact that you perform better than the systems ought to on a, on a theoretical basis but if no, you but, are maintaining the facility. But, but you said on a theoretical basis. Um, Mr. Carmen has just uh, finished, a, uh, well, has been involved in some litigation regarding Dynagen. They just filed a, a large suit, uh, I guess it was, uh, some of those were violations of the Clean Air Act. And mm -hmm. the potential penalty is something like yeah. $27 million for a better than a thousand violations of the Clean Air Act. Now. Uh, I mean, there are some serious uh, problems associated with that plant in terms of their air emissions, uh, apparently. Uh, well, as I told you before we appeared on the show, I'm not going to talk about an individual facility. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but the point I was making is that the theoretical calculations cause you to report higher numbers than the actual calculations. Mm -hmm. So that shows that once you do begin monitoring, once you do get a better idea of what your emissions are, you find out they're much lower than the original reported emissions. Well, I think, you know, again, uh, the bottom line for me is that in many of the plants that I've been involved in uh, conducting inspections since 1980, I have not seen that many monitoring devices. So uh, you have to go back to making theoretical estimates. And so I don't think that this is going to be an absolutely accurate reflection of what these uh, emissions are. Well, I think, uh, Neil, if you've got some basis for that claim, I really think you need to come forth with it, okay? Neil is uh, familiar with Odessa. I know that the petrochemical complex uh, in that area, there's a six-foot layer of benzene on the local groundwater. I've, I've visited the areas near there. Uh, the El Ranchito subdivision is one. Uh, people rely on that local aquifer. Uh, they can't use the water. Uh, burns their skin, kills their, kills their plants. Uh, I mean, there's obviously a serious case of groundwater contamination where individuals are directly affected. What, what do you know about that? Well, the only thing I've seen is, is a permit which did come through for one of the facilities there at the Odessa Petrochemical Complex in which there was approximately 500,000 gallons of about 94.5% benzene. Uh, the rest of the material uh, was, uh, you know, consisting of aromatic compounds, benzene derivatives like uh, your xylenes and toluenes. Uh, but anyway, apparently uh, what was reported uh, uh, publicly by the Texas Water Commission is that the groundwater contamination underneath this plant stopped at the plant property line. Uh, I find that difficult to believe, although I'm not a hydrologist, uh, but this was what was publicly report reported by the Texas Water Commission. So they, you know, claimed that there was not uh, a groundwater impact from this plant uh, at the subdivision next door at El Ranchito. I don't think it's unhealthy to be suspicious either. Certainly you ought to ask questions, but I certainly think that uh, in any individual instance you can get answers to those questions. Texas Water Commission doesn't hide from people in an area, and anyone who'd suggest that just hadn't checked their facts. 
But John, this is not an isolated incident in Ector County uh, for the Texas Water Commission. There was a uh, Ector County drum factory which uh, cleaned uh, chemical drums for years and contaminated the uh, soil on the ground underneath the plant very severely until now it's a Superfund site. Well, the company went out of business, they went bankrupt, and the taxpayers are going to be hit with a 10 to $15 million Superfund cleanup. So, you know, where was the Texas Water Commission when all this contamination was actually taking place? Well, I appreciate your concern for, for those companies that are having to pay those taxes into the Superfund to clean up that site. But I also want to say that I can't address any individual facility unless I've had time to get my facts together. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you've done a little investigating on this, <coughs> and you know more about that particular facility than I do. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about, uh, I think that one of the issues regarding the chemical industry in Texas is obviously it's a very powerful industry. It's very big. Uh, I was looking at your newsletter, and uh, I mean, some of the members of your board of directors include Union Carbide, DuPont, Sterling Chemical, Alcoa, Dow, Monsanto. Uh, I just did some checking and the annual sales of 13 companies or their parents that are on the board of directors of the Chemical Council had annual sales last year combined of $350 billion. I'll that's, remember that number. That's, that's number greater than the GNP of China and <laughs> Finland combined. So obviously we're, we're dealing with very powerful industry here. It has a lot of money to, uh, not to slam you, but to hire individuals to, to plead their case. Uh, uh, you could have fooled me with the tooling around we're getting sometimes. <laughs> oh, that, 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 the, that the industry doesn't have much sway in the state? or? Oh, no, I'm, I'm being facetious. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank you, Neil and, and John, for being here. Um, now here we have some information about Sarah Title III and a story about pollution prevention. R-I-G-H-T, to know, it's your right to know. It's your life, it's your home, it's your neighborhood. It's your right, your right, your right to know. Not only do large industries release and store dangerous chemicals, in your neighborhood, dangerous or toxic chemicals are being used or created during the normal course of business every day. The presence of these chemicals goes unnoticed most of the time, but in emergencies, it is vital that firefighters, doctors, and other emergency teams know which chemicals they are dealing with. Information about chemical hazards in our community is available to any citizen thanks to the federal law commonly called SARA Title III, Community Right to Know. Lead, copper, acetone, zinc, ammonia, hydrogen peroxide, fluorine, If you believe ozone, hazardous fluorine, chemicals are being released benzene, in your neighborhood, fluorine, at businesses where you trade or where you work, you need to notify the authorities. Ethylbenzene, xylene, pyrene, nicotine. Though progress has been made in controlling pollution, the release of toxic chemicals continues. In Texas, almost 84 million pounds of toxics are released each year, making Texas one of the top two generators in the United States. The challenge for industry is to minimize the generation of hazardous wastes and focus on eliminating wastes at the source to reduce the need for off-site treatment and disposal facilities. This is known as source reduction. Earthline visited Semitech and Motorola in Austin to observe the latest trends in minimizing wastes by the semiconductor industry. At Semitech, a consortium of chip manufacturers, research is being conducted to help the U.S. remain competitive in computer chip manufacturing. If you have to use hazardous materials, what you want to do is you want to use small volumes and try to create as little waste as you can. And some of the best ways of minimizing waste um, are to first uh, try to reduce at the source try to find ways of reducing the, the volumes of chemicals. And one way that we do that is a reprocessor technology. Uh, we have a sulfuric acid reprocessor and a hydrofluoric acid reprocessor. Those are two of some of the chemicals that we work with here at the plant. And the reprocessor allows us to take the chemical and use it in a recycling mode. We provide it to the fab where it is used, and then it comes back to the piece of equipment. We are able to reclaim it. We take it, we take out the things that the people in the fab don't want. We get rid of the water, we get rid of the particles. Uh, we are also able to produce the oxidizer that is usually added at the bath, at the point of use, and we are able to reprocess and reclaim that since it's also made from the same sulfuric rather than a different chemical. So this is in place with constant flowing baths for over two years here. Uh, it doesn't do any good to develop this great technology that competes with the Japanese if people get hurt or the environment's hurt along the way. And it, so we find that the technology is there 
and we're working to develop even newer and better technologies. And we really think it can be done, and we have every intention of seeing that, that uh, we're able to transfer that technology so other companies can compete and do good work and still take care of the environment and people at the same time. What we have is an a electroplating line where we actually plate the leads for the final semiconductor devices. And we'll start with the copper lead frames and do a tin lead solder plate on them. They go through a, a plating solution, an electric current is induced through it. Um, they come out and then go through a rinse stream. And it's in that rinse stream where the, the waste stream is generated. It's a, basically a wastewater stream. Uh, what we're required to remove are low levels of lead and copper. And those are the two parameters that, that we remove in the system. The water comes from the plating area, it goes into a large surge tank behind me. It then goes through some filters and then enters the exchange columns. Uh, the ion exchange columns have a resin in them that captures the copper and the lead. Um, the water then passes out of the system into a final pH adjust tank and then into the city's sewer system. But all the lead and copper is captured on the exchange resins. Once the resins are saturated, we'll take the system offline put a chemical solution into the resin beds that soaks the copper and iron and the lead back off the resins. We'll take that solution, put it into a large electroplating tank and replate the metals back onto a large metal surface. So we actually do the plating twice. We do the plating once in the product line and then once in the plating system in the wastewater treatment system itself. The end result is a, a copper plate if there's copper in solution or a lead plate if that's what we're pulling out of the system, um, which can be recycled just like any other copper waste. And the big difference between this and conventional systems is the absence of sludge. Um, most plating systems end up with a large volume of sludge. Uh, what we end up with is a recyclable product that doesn't have to be landfilled and can actually be put back into commerce. In an effort to minimize the release of ozone-damaging chemicals, the Motorola facility in Oak Hill has installed new, more ozone-friendly equipment. So what we did was uh, investigate what were the proper refrigerants to comply with uh, the latest uh, Montreal Accords that Motorola has adopted, as well as what future uh, banning, if any, uh, refrigerants would take place. And so we came upon the, this particular manufacturer had available, just uh, recently come out in the market, this new refrigerant. It's called uh, um, R123, uh, where basically that's been recently developed by the DuPont company that it has a 120th of the ozone depletion factor that the old refrigerants had that we would have had to have used. To reduce pollution, we need to foster new and innovative technologies that use resources more efficiently, generate less wastes, and reuse or recycle materials. We should view our wastes as natural resources, which can be used again and again. By minimizing wastes today, we may save ourselves from pollution and health problems in the future. In spite of Texas's serious pollution problems, most of Texas is still quite beautiful. Let's try to get outdoors and see some of our state. Here are the upcoming Sierra Club outings. Well, that's our show for now. Tune in next time when Annette Lavoy will host. Until then, remember, what you do for the earth, you do for yourself. <laughs>